So I'm going to start about some interesting stuff because the rest of the talk is kind of boring, actually. Uh, but, but this is a more interesting uh, slide of the, of the talk, you know? Stuff that I didn't do, other people did, yeah? So it's software for people who... Have you, I assume everybody here knows Doom. So it's software is a company that created Doom. It's pronounced it's software. I'm not sure why, but it is. So they did a lot of cool stuff, you know, a lot of cool games. These are some of the games they did. And uh, to me and to a lot of people, the most interesting and the coolest thing they did, actually, is they open sourced uh, everything they did. And that's, that's pretty cool, you know. So because back in the 90s and beginning of the 2000s, maybe now a bit less, but, but back then, they were one of the biggest gaming companies in the whole world, you know. And, uh, you know, for somebody, imagine if, if GTA, for example, or Call of Duty or FIFA even, you know, got open source today. It's not something, okay, so I'm going to stand there. So it's not something that, uh, that happens pretty often nowadays, you know, but back in the 90s, these guys were pretty big. They did a lot of stuff, and they open source their stuff. And people hacked their stuff, they modded their stuff, and it's pretty cool. I think so, at least. So, uh, so yeah. It's a very different era, of course, the 90s, you know, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have Stack Overflow. So everybody did stuff their own way, they did it and redid it and reinvented shit, and it's, it's cool. And you see a lot of that stuff, you know, if you, if you look at the source code, and it's, they're not the only people that open source that stuff. Excuse me. People. Hello. Hello. Organizers. Okay. Never mind. So, uh, if you look at a lot of uh, source code that was open source back then, you know, you will see people doing the same things in different ways, you know. Can somebody please close the door? Uh, okay, never mind. So, uh, so that, that's, that's the bit, you know, about reinventing the wheel and such, you know. Uh, and yeah, some the nerd rage anecdotes is also a fun story that has absolutely nothing to do with me. But uh, one of the biggest games they did back in the 90s was Doom, you know, the original Doom. And the open source was back in 97, I think. And, you know, people were looking at the source code and such, and somebody noticed something very weird about the source code. And the way um, they were loading the assets, you know, so the as as assets in games, you know, are pictures, sounds, anything that's used in the game that isn't part of the source code, yeah? And the way it's loaded in the game, it's basically a huge RAR file or zip file, I don't remember. And you just go through the whole file, you know, I want the picture of, I don't know, the monster, I can't remember the monster name, but monster A, for example. And just keep iterating until you find your, your, uh, your monster file, you know, and then display it on the screen. And, you know, while I'm telling the story, a lot of you people are thinking, as I was, you know, this is very inefficient, you know. We all know, you know, something like this, you just index it once and, and load it in a hash map, for example, or a hash table. And then every time I need the monster, I just look it up, and that's, that's that. And, you know, the people started bashing them on news groups or mailing lists, I don't remember. Um, and, and the Doom guys themselves, the, the, so the it's software guys, they were very active back then, you know. They, you can just email them and they would reply, you know. And so they were themselves also on the mailing list. And, uh, and you know, they were people in their 20s, you know, so they were very rude. And, eh, go to hell, you don't know anything, fuck you guys, that kind of stuff. And turns out... Uh, they were actually right, the Doom guys, you know. Their way of doing this was the most stupid, most simple, most low-tech way you could do this. But, you know, they, they were de-optimizing the game to get optimization somewhere else. So 20 years ago, 25 years ago, because Doom was 93, I think, or 92, 25 years ago, you had very limited hardware, you know, you had very limited memory, you had limited processing power. And loading a huge file in memory or creating a hash table of that, it's not as simple as you might think. It's not as, as, you know, as little memory as you might think. Nowadays, everything is cheap. Memory is cheap, you know, and you don't think about that kind of stuff. But back then, they did. And their way was the most efficient. It costs maybe a little more processing power, but this is a very small part of the whole level loading, for example, you know. So, yeah, so it's very efficient on uh, what they did. It's very cool. So, yeah, so that's that story. Like I said, not, nothing to do with me. But uh, so yeah, so Doom 3, that's, that's what I decided to call my project, which is supporting Doom 3 to Java. Uh, I've been working on it now for about, I think, four years, uh, almost four years. It's, it's working more and more and introducing more and more bugs. And, you know, I'm having a lot of fun and uh, I love it. So, uh, so yeah. So I had the intro. So that's, that's important. Um, if you've never done game development before, game development is very, very different than what we do. 
or what I assume most of you do. I'm an enterprise developer myself, and it's very different, you know. Like I just, the story I just told you, you know, about memory 25 years ago, you know, how, how efficient you use, efficiently you use memory or processing power. Most of us don't worry about that kind of stuff, you know. Most of us don't think about hardware, you know. Most of us know nothing about hardware, you know. Uh, the hardware we run on, you know. We maybe know how many cores we have or how many gigs of memory, but we don't know anything about the instruction sets we use and that kind of stuff. But they do, and for them it's very important, you know. So, uh, so yeah, so that being said, you know, so a lot of stuff that's going to be presented here today might not seem very interesting for what we do, or what I do, at least, in enterprise development, but it's very important for what I try to do in this project, you know. So that's, that's the point of this whole talk, you know. So what I came across in this project, and maybe it's helpful, maybe it's not, I'm not really sure. So, so yeah, so disclaimer, I'm not an expert, I didn't work in the original Doom. I'm, you know, there are a lot of people more smarter than me, and you can listen to them, don't listen to me. If I say anything and you think it sounds interesting, please test it before you try it out, you know, so, uh, yeah. So, um, so, yeah, so, uh, the first part of the talk is a bit, you know, features, language features that, uh, that C, C++ have, and Java that doesn't have, you know. And I think they could be very helpful for Java and uh, for development. And they, they were certainly very, if I had had them, they would have been very helpful for this project at least, you know. So, but I didn't have them, and you had to work, I had to work around them, you know. And uh, the first one is overloading, or operator overloading at least. So Java doesn't have operator overloading. And uh, personally, this is, I think this is one of the most requested features every time you have one of those panel sessions and, and people say, okay, here's an architect, what would you request from him or her? And it's almost always, you know, operator overloading comes, uh, you know, on top. So operator overloading, Java doesn't have it, and it's basically, you know, if, if you define an object in any of the other languages, like C Sharp, uh, you can say, okay, if I use the plus, uh, you know, operator with, with this object and then another object from a different type or for the same type, you should do this, for example. And you, you should think about something like if you want to add two uh, vectors or matrices or whatever, quaternions, anything, any mathematical thing, you know. This is, of course, abused, you know, and uh, so this, this example, which I think the people in the first three rows can read, is from C++. This is basically the print line from C++. And as you can see, you use the left shift operator to do, uh, like, piping output or chaining output. I'm not sure what you call this kind of stuff. And this is an abuse for a mathematical oper operator, and this is the, also the main reason why people didn't put this in Java, I heard. I'm not really sure about that. It's ugly, I know, you know, and you can do anything with it. And, uh, um, oh yeah, the quote above, uh, on the top there, is from a paper Guy Steele Guy, uh, wrote a long time ago. He was one of the architects back in the day from, uh, that did a lot of work on Java. And then he disappeared for some reason, I'm not sure why. It was a very cool paper. There's a link here that nobody can read, but you can check it out in the slides. He also did a very cool talk. It's on YouTube about how to grow a language or something like that. Very cool guy, and he stopped working on Java, and this never crystallized. But it's basically, he wanted to put it in Java. It's, it's, it's important, you know. You might not think it because you don't have it. You know? It's the same like lambdas. We didn't think they were important until we had them, and now we can't live without them, you know. So it's kind of like that. So, yeah. So this is an example of a mathematical, yeah, it's just an equation somewhere in the game, yeah? And this is my workaround for how I did it in, in Java, you know? And again, only the first couple of rows can read this. Um, but this is, this is basically what, what, what almost anybody would do, you know? So it's just you create functions or methods for the equivalent uh, or, you know, the same mathematical operator for, for an add or... So I, I create stuff, stuff like O multiply, O plus, O minus, that kind of stuff. Very simple, you know. And um, yeah, it works. It's, it's less readable. For me, it's very, it's, you know, it's, it's much less readable. And it's also very error prone. Um, so this is shown example, um, a very simple equation. You know, you just have three matrices you want to, you know, add A to B and then multiply by C, you know. And, and this is how I, uh, because this, is, this, <laughs> this is an actual bug that I had, you know. I had a lot of these kind of bugs. So this is how, how I would write it at first, you know, because when I was porting the game, I would just type stuff over, you know, and then think, okay, now I have the O multiply, then I'll use that and that kind of stuff. And this is how I would do it, or how I did it at first, and this is absolutely wrong. Uh, because this breaks mathematical operator precedence. Uh, this is how you should do it. 
because this is what actually happens. You, a multiplication comes before an, an, an addition. You know, so you have to multiply it by B by C and then add it to A. And this is kind of like the, the better version of that. But uh, so yeah, this sounds very trivial, sounds very simple, but believe me, it's it's very annoying. Uh, yeah, this is totally unreadable. But uh, somebody had the same uh, problems I had. Um, so yeah, unsigned primitives is also something we don't have in Java. And that's basically primitives, you know, integers or longs or whatever, with only a positive range, you know. But then double the positive range instead of a negative range and a positive range. We don't have that in Java. And there are reasons for why we don't have that. And I don't care about the reasons. It's just very annoying. And the simple solution, of course, you know, it's, it's highlighted up here, or it's not highlighted, but it's up here, for example. For, so this is the C code has an unsigned int, and the simple solution is just, you know, to use the next uh, primitive. And in my case, it was a long. So yeah, it works till it doesn't, you know, because what if you have an unsigned long? What do you do? What do you do then? Um, so yeah. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> this is a side effect because we don't have unsigned uh, primitives in, in Java. Uh, this is a legal Java code. You can create an array with a negative number. You know, it, it will you know break when you come to this point, but it will compile. So yeah, it's, it's cool. Um, so yeah, simple benchmark. I don't really like benchmarks. You know, so uh, they are very biased. Yes. Should I smile? So they're very biased. This is also a very biased uh, benchmark, you know, but it's basically to show the memory usage and, you know, and, and this is a very simple example. You know, it's just a loop and add stuff to each other or, and, or whatever, and, and there's a big difference, you know. So if you go from an int to a long, you know, okay, so your memory usage doesn't go up very much because underneath maybe it gets optimized, maybe it gets boxed or something. I'm not sure, but the processing time, you know, it goes up almost double, you know. And this one, this is also my favorite. So this is an int, this is an integer. It's basically the same thing as the object, you know, and it's the primitive. And there's a difference there. You wouldn't think it, you know, because, oh, we've always been told in conferences that it's basically the same, that JVM does all that optimization for you. And it, it really does, you know, it's, it's negligible as long as you do it, I don't know, a thousand times or something. But games are, you know, a lot of, you know, nested loops and, and whatever. So you're, you're talking about millions of, of iterations, that kind of stuff. So, you know, in the example, I go to up to integer and max value. So that's, so that's a lot. So you, you begin to notice that kind of stuff. So, yeah. So we don't have that in Java, and uh, I'm not sure why. So immutability. Yeah, I wanted really to ask, Venkat was, was here <laughs> this morning, of course, and he talked about immutability, and he said it was awesome, but Java doesn't have it, so I'm not really sure what he meant by that. Uh, and I didn't catch him afterwards, so... Uh, but yeah, Java doesn't have really good immutability out of the box. Uh, that's very annoying. Uh, maybe it will change someday, but uh, I'm not sure. Um, but C++ has awesome immutability uh, support out of the box. Um, and just to pick one example, the yellow one, for example, you can define a method uh, immutable in, uh, in, uh, in C++. And that basically says that this method isn't allowed to change anything within the object from where it's called. You know? uh, and that's awesome. You know, just define a method, a read-only method, that's basically it. Uh, we don't have something that simple in Java. The other examples are also cool, but I'm um, see that time is running out uh, pretty fast. Uh, but but, for, but uh, to highlight something is in C++ when you define something const, C-O-N-S-T, const, constant, I think, um, that basically you change the, now it's not really you change the type, but it, be, it becomes a different thing, you know. So const idvec3, for example, is not the same thing as an idvec3. But granted, you know, C++ is very low level, you know, it's, it's, you can get lower than that, but when you, when you work on that level, you can break almost anything, you know? So if you have immutability, you can break it. And if you have broken immutability, you can fix it. You can do almost anything. But out of the box, this works pretty cool, you know? So yeah, we don't have that in Java. Uh, again, uh, it's very annoying. Uh, you can work around most of this stuff, but it's, it's error prone. You, know, you just have to, you know, be careful. And that's, that's, that's difficult, for me at least. So yeah, Java has final, which works for some cases and such. Oh. Um, yeah, I'm gonna skip this one. Sorry. And I'm gonna do a quick one on this one. Um, so 
So enum in Java enumeration um, is very, it's very weird thing. Uh, so let's pick this one. And I hope everybody can read this one because uh, it took me about, uh, yeah, whatever. So, uh, so enum in Java is, uh, in my opinion, a very weird thing. It's, it's somewhere in between everything. You know? It's not a class. It's not an interface. It's not an abstract class. It's, not, it's, it's some, somewhere in between. You can do amazing stuff with enums. You know? So here you can you know, implement serializable. You make an enum serializable. I think enum is serializable. I'm not sure. Uh, you, know, you can have methods. You can have static methods. You know, abstract methods. Uh, you can override stuff because you have abstract methods. You, know? you can do amazing stuff with them. Um, except uh, this, actually. So this is an enum from C++. This is the most, and it's not only from C++, a lot of languages do enums in this kind of simplistic way. And I'm not sure if this is readable, but um, this, this you can do in Java. You, know? you can't just give an enum a value. You know? And that's, that's, that's the most basic thing you actually want an enum to do, but you can't do that in Java. And uh, I see people laughing. Maybe they uh, recognize this, but uh, and it's annoying. And this you can do, and this people do do. You know, uh, in my current projects, people do this all the time, and I go crazy when they do this. And but yeah, it drives me nuts. But you can't do anything about it. So yeah, so so enums are very weird in Java, and uh, yeah, I'm not sure why, really, but okay. So yeah, example of weirdness. Let's skip it. Um, yeah. Inheritance is also very weird in Java uh, because of type erasure and stuff. Uh, but uh, a pattern you come across a lot in, you know, in, in I came across a lot in, in this game at least, was, you know, if you're somewhere in an object and you want to call the super.super .super function in Java terms. And uh, it turns out that's very, very, very difficult to do in Java. You know, I always thought it was, was much easier, but I never needed it. Till I needed, actually needed it, and then I tried to do it, and it wasn't as easy as, as I thought. You know, the the solution itself is easy, or the solution I chose is just to overexpose the method. So if you have an you know super dot super method, so a inherits from b and b inherits from c, so you inherit, you expose the function from c in b. It's a very stupid solution, but you know it works, and I spend too much time on something like this. But you can't do that. Uh, the super dot super function, you can't really do that very easily in Java, and it's also very annoying. Um, yeah, and also, you know, equals and hash code are inherited. You know, if anybody knows a good reason for why, please tell me. Um, yeah. Most of you guys are from Turkey, yeah? So do you guys, like, uh, study C++ in school here, or, or Java directly? C++, yeah? When I was in school, I studied in Holland, and people studied C++, uh, people changed courses to study something else because of pointers. So I'm not sure how it is here, you know, but where, where I grew up, no, seriously. Pointers, and so this example, as, you know, or this meme, you know, as ridiculous as it is, you know, it's not really that far-fetched for how terrible it is. Um, pointers are just, they're difficult, you know, so if, if you've done them, they're just difficult, they're different, but they're awesome, and I think they're awesome. And, you know, in this game, it's full of pointers, C++ game, of course. And working with stuff like that in Java is, uh, is, is difficult. So, so this, is a, this is a common pattern, for, for example, in, uh, in, in, in this game. Um, and it's basically if you have multiple return, uh, multiple, return, uh, multiple return statements, multiple return objects. You know, if you want to return more, more than one value. You know? So in this case, you want to return the type and skip. So in other languages, you can do multiple return uh, things. I don't remember what they're called. Values, or for example, so like in Go, you know, or in Python with their tuplets or whatever they're, they're called. Now in Java, you don't have that. C++, you don't have that as well. But this is the common way to do that in C++. You just pass out the pointer and then pa put the value within the pointer and then just return it, you know. So yeah, how do you do that in Java? You don't. So how did I do that in Java? And it's just, you know, create a, a lot of uh, one element arrays and give them as input and then get the output and that kind of stuff. And the reason I did it this way, you know, is I wanted to keep the code as, you know, I wanted the code to look as much as the C++ version as possible, you know, to make debugging easier and that kind of stuff, because it's uh, very buggy, as you will see near the end. So, uh, so yeah. So yeah, this is, this is a common thing you can do with pointers, and it's difficult to do with other stuff. Uh, 
This is my favorite way to do it. Other people say create an object, that kind of stuff. I think that's more ugly. Um, and this is also a cool thing. You can just cast pointers to other stuff. Um, so it's more visible in this example, I think. Yeah. So here, you have to reinterpret cast and that kind of stuff. And you can basically, in C++, almost, you know, you can almost cast anything to anything else, you know. So if I have an object and I know it has, like, an array uh, with three arrays of floats, for example, like it's a three by three matrix, so you have an array of three arrays, you know. I can just say, you know, cast this to a, a float pointer of nine, you know, because I know the, the nine floats are, you know, consecutive. So that's awesome. You can do that in C++. In Java, that's, that's, it's difficult to do that, you know. It's, 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 it's not, not so easy, you know. And you can also do a lot of mathematical stuff on, on, on pointers. So here, for example, and this is the destination pointer, which is the float pointer of the matrix. So this matrix is cast to the destination pointer. But basically, you can here increment it, and you increment it by the size of the pointer. So we know it's a float pointer, so it increments it by four bytes. If I then uh, cast it to, I don't know, uh, short, for example, it increments it by two bytes when I do a plus plus and that kind of stuff. And you can add and, and subtract, and this is, this is cool stuff you can do with pointers. Again, very difficult to do in Java, and very necessary for this kind of stuff. So yeah, oh yeah. So the one pointer we do have in Java, and this is a really a, you know a slap in the face kind of thing, is a null pointer. And I always find this very funny, you know, because you get all the shit of pointers, you get all the problems of pointers without getting actual pointers, you know. And there's also a reason for why you do have this, but it's not for you as a developer or the programmer or whatever, you know. It's not really useful, you know, that that you have this. So yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this is, this is the other way around, stuff that's very shit in C++, but we, uh, and we don't have it in Java, and thank God we don't have it in Java. I might skip some, some of these uh, slides, but uh, yeah. So uh, we don't have macros in Java, and it's cool that we don't have macros. Um, very quickly, uh, macros, basically, in C++, uh, you can define stuff that's not really code, and you can use it somewhere in your code, and it will, will be searched and replaced before you compile. So here we define a macro square, and it says, okay, square takes something, and it then re replaces that something, which is between the brackets, with the other stuff, which, which is between the brackets. And that's it. We don't care about types. It's not a function. It's not really anything, you know? But it's also very error-prone. So this, this example, you say x2 is square x++. Plus plus, and I'm, I'm very certain, you know, I didn't know. Sorry. So, so this is a common example on why you shouldn't use macros. You know, it's, this is from Stack Overflow, I think. And when I saw the example before, I scrolled down for why you shouldn't really use it. I didn't really think this would be replaced with this. So they're very difficult to, to debug, I think, and very uh, annoying. And I'm going to skip this one as well. Um, so yeah, funny picture. Macros really aren't anything. So they might look like a function. They're not a function. They might look like a constant. They're not a constant, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so this is a simple. So this, you can also define macro, they also have very weird scope. So this, you define the macro within the function, and then you undefine it before you exit the function. So this is, that's, yeah, it's weird, you know? So this, this macro gets, becomes something like this, you know? Because this macro uses a different macro, which is, you know, defined somewhere else. But that's not what I wanted to show. And what I wanted to show was this, which I highlighted. So this is the same macro that is used in two different functions. And one has floats uh, as, as input, and the other uh, is a float point, and the other has a, has a byte pointer as, uh, as input. And macros don't care. They just search and replace. And you might get a weird compile error that makes no sense to the code you have. So macros are very dangerous and evil, and people hate them. And uh, yeah. So this is another one, uh, which you might understand. But, uh, so yeah, so uh, the same way, you know, we, 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 you know, we adore camel case in Java. The C++ people have Hungarian notation. And the Hungarian notation, it's, it's really a convention, you know, it's not really the same way camel case is a convention, you don't really have to use it, but it is used, and Hungarian notation is one of those evil things. Uh, so this is an example of Hungarian notation, the, the highlighted parts are, so yeah, this is M underscore PSZ name, and M underscore means that it's a member, and the P pointer SZ is in a string, null terminated, zero terminated, you know, and then you get the name, you know, Maybe it's its name. Maybe that's the name. Actually, I, I'm not really sure. So yeah, Hungarian notation is also very uh, shitty. Um, 
yeah, we don't have it in Java. People don't use it in Java. I'm not sure why, but I'm grateful for it. So it's, uh, it's, it's very annoying. So, so this, is, yeah, this is not readable, I think, but it's an example of how shitty Hungarian notation can become. And this is also not readable, I think, but this is a cool picture. You should look it up. Yeah, sorry. I, didn't, I think the screen would be this uh, small. So uh, can anybody read this? Anybody at all? Nobody? Yeah. OK. So we don't have unions either in, uh, C++, in uh, Java. Uh, personally, I, I'm grateful for that. Unions are very difficult uh, little creatures. Um, so this is a simple example of a union. This is not really the reason unions exist. Yeah, the reason unions exist, as I discovered, uh, is for unions are from C, and C didn't have inheritance. And he did some inheritance tricks with unions. But that's very complicated to do, so people did this kind of stuff with unions and such. And um, yeah, so this is a picture I created. So, so this, this was a union in the game that really drove me uh, crazy for a couple of, uh, I think, three months or something like that to get this part right. So this is basically, I'm not sure. So if you look here, uh, eval pointer, you know, is a, is a pointer of this, of the type of this union, you know. So this was plain evil to, to, you know, try to port and such, you know. And it had a lot of references, so to get this right, it really took a lot of time. And uh, it made me, you know, a non-believer in, in unions, so, uh, so yeah. Um, so I'm going to skip most of this part, I think, because I want to have some time at the end. Um, so yeah, this is some stuff you know in between, you know, some stuff that we don't have. Maybe it's cool to have, maybe it's not cool to have. I'm not sure. You know, I didn't really miss it, but I I saw the, the how powerful it was in some some parts of it, you know. And the first one was destructors, uh, deconstructors, destructors, whatever they're called. So we don't have them in in Java. Uh, we have uh, what's the name of this? Uh, finalize, which doesn't work, or you know, it's not helpful. But in C++ you have them. You know, you always have them. You always had them. And uh, you always, and, and, and in this game, uh, at least, you know, people, you know, did a lot of, what do you call something like this? Uh, they misused them, you know, the same way we misuse the JVM sometimes. So, yeah, so they misused it and, uh, you know, put a lot of stuff, because, you know, this will always be called in C++, you know. So you, you put a lot of stuff in it, you know, just, you know, stop sound and, you know, the free descript and whatever, and deconstruct and that kind of stuff. And, you know, it's, it's not very difficult to do this in Java, you know, just call the function, but it, it happens out of the box for you in, 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 uh, in C++. Here you have to do all the, you know, extra effort. And I think the Java community recognized this because they created the auto-closable, or closable, you know, interface, which is awesome, except it, it works, diff it's difficult to, uh, you know, you have to use it with a for, uh, with try, uh, try, what is it called? Try with resources. So, yeah, it's annoying. So I'm going to skip this one, this one as well, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, inlining. So, uh, so I'm a fan of inlining. Uh, um, yeah, so you can't do this in Java. It's difficult to do this in Java. I see, uh, yeah. Um, inlining is basically, you know, every time you call a function, you have to jump to the function and come back to, uh, from the function. That's, that's basically how it works. In, in, and when you inline it, you just say, you know, copy the, the whole function in, in the other function where you call it. So that's a very simplistic way of, of how it works. In languages like C++, you can just force the inline because you know this function has to be inlined. In Java, you can do that. You know, you have a lot of, you know, with stuff to do to, to force something to be inlined. Maybe, maybe, you know, you have that new thing, Graal. Maybe it will work with that. I'm not sure. Uh, but here, it, it's very difficult. So, yeah, we don't have this. And I'm pretty sure, so I haven't done any performance testing yet, but I'm pretty sure there's a lot of performance loss uh, due to something like this, you know, because the original guys, you know, they, they spent like seven years on the game and did a heavy optimization, worked on almost everything. So, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure most of our, uh, you know, decisions were right, you know. So, yeah, there was, this is, the, uh, I think, one of the cooler parts of the, of the talk. One of the more useful parts of the talk, actually. So, yeah. So, because we don't have pointers in, uh, in Java, uh, we don't have memory addresses, or we don't have um, static memory addresses, you know? So if an object is somewhere in memory, it won't stay there in memory, you know? It's not, that's not really the reason, because we don't have pointers, but that's basically the gist of it, why, why we don't have this awesome functionality. In C++, you can just watch a memory, memory address, you know? If somebody accesses it or some, uh, somebody changes it, you can, let a, you know, can, can activate the breakpoints. And that's very helpful, you know, for 
large code bases where one object can be referenced by 200, 300 times or something, and you want to know when or where it happens, you know, instead of putting 300 breakpoints. So that's awesome. In C++, it's awesome, it's very easy. In Java, we don't have that. Um, but what we do have, so this is from IntelliJ, you have something called a field watch point or something like that, a uh, field breakpoint. I'm not sure what it's called anymore. So you have it, you can set it up, you can watch a specific uh, f the um, field of a specific object instance. Uh, the only problem is it's very, very, very slow. It's very slow. It's, it's too slow to, for me at least, you know, for, for the game, something with millions of uh, iterations and such, it, it doesn't work, you know. For enterprise applications, it works awesomely. So I use it for my enterprise stuff as well, and, and it works. But for the game, it doesn't work. And uh, I, was, I was at a conference once, and they had you know, the, uh, the JetBrains guys, and I asked them, why, why is it so slow? And, and, and they said, no, it's, it's not really our fault. It's, this, is this is a functionality in the JVMTI, and nobody uses it except us. I'm not sure why. But yeah, it's, it's just slow, and nobody wants to touch the JVMs because the JVM is deprecated or something. So, uh, so yeah, it's not going to be fixed. But it is there. You can use it. So it's, it's the closest thing you can get. It's the closest you can get something like this. Uh, so yeah, it's cool. Um, yeah, so this, I think, I will skip this one. Yeah, actually, yeah. No, no I'm going to skip this one. Sorry. So this is, something, uh, this is also something very awesome in, uh, in Java. And uh, I discovered lately, or no, I keep discovering actually, not a lot of people know about this. And it's, it's very weird that people don't know about this. It's, it's very old functionality. But basically, when you set a breakpoint, you, you get a call stack, and you can just drop a frame and go back in time. It's awesome. It's, it's really awesome. That's, that's basically it. It has some constraints. Um, if you change something out of scope, it doesn't roll that back, you know? So if you have something like with a local scope, local scope of the function, for example, or the method, or whatever your breakpoint is, and you drop that frame, everything will be turned back. But if you change something outside of that scope, out of the scope of the function and such, you're, uh, you're fucked, you know? So, uh, but if you know that that happens, then you can still debug, you know? It's, it's, it's not, 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 not that bad. Uh, but it's awesome. Force returns also awesome, but that's that's a different uh, story. Um, so yeah, but uh, this is from GDB. GDB is like uh, you have GCC. That's the awesome compiler from GNU, and GDB is their uh, debugger. And they have something called reverse step, and that's that's really time machine shit. You know, you can just step back and revert everything. Uh, it doesn't work 100%. I haven't used it a lot myself, but I keep looking, you know, on, on forums and, and you know Stack Overflow and such, and everybody says, yeah, it works, but you have to be careful when you use it with I don't know hardware or interrupts or whatever. And so, but yeah, I think for basic stuff like what I, what, what I do here, it's it's awesome. So uh, we don't have that in, in Java. Uh, I do remember a couple of years ago there was a project uh, to introduce something like this. I think it was called like time machine debugger or something like that. Um, I think for a time it was even bundled with uh, IntelliJ, uh, the ultimate edition at least. I could never get it to work, unfortunately. It was called Kronos debugger, Chronum developer, uh, something with, with Kronos in the name. Uh, I could never get it to work. Uh, as far as I could see, it was a recorder debugger, you know, so it would record stuff and replay it and that kind of stuff. But they, you know, they said, no, 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 it's not a recorder. It's, you can really go back in time. But you know, it's, it was too difficult for me to, to get it operational. So if maybe it still exists. Maybe it's awesome. I'm, I'm not sure. So yeah, um, yeah, this is this is cool. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry for the people at the back. You can't see this, but this is really awesome. Um, so I talked before about the operator precedence. You know, when I did with the operator overlay, it's something you know, it's just an it's it's a mathematical something. It's it's from math, and we have it in programming languages and such. And uh, operator precedence um, turns out to be very important for floating points. And it's, it's also for simple operators, you know. So, so this, for example, the BLA1 and BLA2, you do a division and a multiplication. So mathematically speaking, the order in which you do things for in this particular uh, equation doesn't really matter much, you know. Kind of, you know. Um, but here, in Java, it's not only in Java, actually. This is also in C++. This is an IEEE thing. Uh, so here, uh, the first one, you know, we divide B by C, and then we multiply by A, and then in the second one, you know, we do it that way and such. You actually get two different results, you know. 
And the reason for that is, you know, because, because the floating points, the IEEE floating points at least, they have very multi, uh, limited precision, you know. So you have to uh, round off, you know, and you round off, in this case, you round off first what's in between the brackets and then you multiply it. And in the other case, you know, just round off as you go. And you get different results. This one, for example, these are actual, you can just run them, you know. This one, I don't remember which one, either Blanc 1 or Blanc 2, produces zero. And the other one produces an actual number. So that's, that's how fucked this can get. Um, uh, and yeah, this is one of my favorites, because I had bugs. These are all bugs, you know. So these, I had a bug, and it took me, I don't know, like two weeks to find it or something. Because, you know, I had a, I had a piece of code, this one especially. This, this was a piece of code. And uh, you know, I was getting bored, and I thought to myself, I'm going to be creative. You know, instead of adding B to C, you know, no, 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 I'm going to write less code. I'm going to remove two whole brackets. So I'm going to remove the brackets and then subtract everything. You know, and then you get a zero, and it doesn't work. So yeah, so this is the lesson I learned. You know, because math, uh, fuck math. So yeah, so uh, even worse, and this is even, uh, it's not worse, it's, it's even better. Even worse, here is the exact same operation. So in the, in the previous one, you know, we showed the multiplication, then we showed the division. So in the same equation. But here, you multiply stuff by each other. And here, I was uh, smart enough to uh, put the result at the end. And yeah, it's, it's still not the same result. You know? So one is 0 0.001 more than the other. And you might think that doesn't matter much. You know? But if you do that you know, 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times you know, in a row, and then imagine that in 3D space, it really doesn't work, you know? And I had a lot of problems with the kind of stuff, you know, I had collisions that were colliding where, while nothing was near it, and then I had stuff that was on top of each other and wasn't colliding with, you know, physics stuff, 3D. So yeah, and here is again the same example with, multi, uh, with addition, without, without even, oh, sorry. Yeah, it's your fault, yeah. So without even, you know, converting it to subtraction. And again, I'm not sure if it's visible, but it's not, it's not the same number, you know? And, you know, it's, it's a simple reason. Everybody knows it, but nobody actually, you know, knows it. You know it, but, but you don't come across it, so you forget it. And, and then 10 years in the future, you come across it, and you feel stupid, and then you cry, and whatever. So yeah, conditional checkpoints is also very, uh, I also very love them very much. So conditional breakpoints are, uh, sorry, breakpoints, yeah. So conditional breakpoints are basically you know, breakpoints where you set the condition within the breakpoint itself. So this is an example, it's also from IntelliJ. You have a breakpoint with a question mark, and then you set here the condition, okay, when should this breakpoint go off? The other sort of breakpoint, or the normal breakpoint, is just, you know, if you look at the, at the if statement, it has the same condition as this one, and within you set the normal breakpoint, yeah? This is basically just to show how, you know, to, to measure how much time each one of these takes. And the conventional wisdom would say they're almost as fast, because this is a breakpoint, this is a breakpoint. It turns out they're not as fast at all. So this is another benchmark. Like I said, I hate benchmarks, but uh, they work sometimes. Um, so I did, I did the test, you know, I just measured the time and put it in an Excel sheet, and Excel did some stuff for me. So you can ex ignore the first one, but, you know, from here on, you know. So it turns out a conditional breakpoint is about uh, 180 times slower as such. So this is basically just print lines, so it's not micro benchmarking tools or whatever, and it's much slower. And the reason for that is, you know, when you, when you use a conditional breakpoint, you switch to interpretive mode, which is very slow. Interpretive mode is basically just reading a script, you know, instead of compiling and optimizing the code and such. So, so yeah, discovering stuff like this, you know, it's, it's, I didn't know this at all, actually, you know, when I went on Stack Overflow, people Everybody knew it because on Stack Overflow, everybody's an expert, of course, you know. But I didn't know this, you know, and it's just, you know, you notice it. You do a conditional breakpoint and your frame rate goes from 60 to 5. And you do a normal breakpoint and your frame rate goes from 60 to, to 55 or something, you know. It's just, it's, it's, it's very, uh, but yeah, of course, for a normal breakpoint, for the, like in this example, I have to recompile the code. Sometimes you can hot swap the code, but not always. So yeah, that's also something very useful. And this is the last uh, slide, I think, before I give the demo. Um, I had a, this is a bug, this is from actual bug. I'm not sure if you guys can see this, but if you look at the left one, it's a bit blue, and the right one is not so blue. Uh, this, this was very early in the game, de in the development phase. Uh, it was one of the first things, first working things I got. But the left one, like I said, is very blue. 
and I, I didn't notice it was blue because I was happy, of course. But after a while, I noticed it and thought it was a very simple thing to fix. But it, it took me like three weeks. Uh, and it turns out, so this is, you know, this is an MPEG video, uh, MPEG, MPEG uh, video. And, oh, and for this, you know, I have a huge byte buffer, which has the whole, whole video. And I just, you know, I pick frames from that and I decode them, you know, and then I view them on the screen one by one. You know, so the game has an MPEG player within, within the game, yeah? Um, and it turns out for the byte buffer, uh, without going into too much detail, I was using Little Endian, I think, or Big Endian, I don't remember. And, and at a certain point in time, if you've never used byte buffers, they're awesome, except this part, which, which I'm talking about right now. And at a certain point in time, I was doing a duplicate on the byte buffer, or a slice, I don't remember. Byte buffers have a couple of functions. One of them is duplicate, which is like a clone. Uh, and then you have a slice, which is like uh, you know a, a clone, but with a pointer pointed to a different part of the byte buffer and that kind of stuff. And it turns out when you do a duplicate or a slice or whatever, uh, you ignore the endianness that you've chosen. You always choose the de default endianness of the machine. So you know instead of RGBA, it switches back to BARG or, so, or something like that. That's why you get something blue like this. And you know later I, I was at a conference and I asked one of the architects why is this. So, you know, and I said, yeah, this is actually a bug, you know, because, but because of backwards compatibility, we won't fix it. So, yeah, this is a bug in Java. Yeah? It's not, docu it's, it's not really documented, you know. It's, uh, it's yeah, I think, a duplicate and slice and one more. I don't remember which one. But, uh, but yeah, so uh, uh, that. And that, I think, was the last slide. And then I'm going to show you some cool stuff. Yeah, that was the last slide. And I'm going to show you a demo without sound because I don't have sound. And while the demo loads, does anybody have any questions? It is going to take about a minute to load, so awkward silence. Sorry? This looks horrible. So yeah. It's supposed to be square. But because of the resolution, it doesn't look uh, cool at all. Uh, let's see if I can do this. I don't think I can do this. Yeah, that's a pointer. Uh, yeah, show, so I'm showing everything in wireframe because the game is still too dark, especially for this room. Uh, and this is much easier to see because I have a lot of problems with textures and physics and I have problems with everything, actually. No questions? Any comments? Yes, sir. Um, does it make a lot of sense to create my own memory managed byte buffer array? Am I saying this right? Yeah. And just do it there instead of. Um, it does make a lot of sense, but it, in this particular case, it doesn't. Um, so it doesn't make a lot of sense because it's a very good idea. It doesn't make a lot of sense because I'm using, uh, for this, I'm using OpenGL. And the, the Java bindings for OpenGL request, require di direct by, uh, byte buffers. So I'm forced to use them. Um, I'm, I can't really do anything else. But, uh, but yeah, I tried that, uh, but yeah, it. it yeah, I, I can't really, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, so I wanted to show the, the rest of the demo, but I can, uh, have you ever, th uh, oh, that's okay. Anything is fine. A lot about uh, inventing a DSL domain specific language for the, can you show me the rest of the question, please? Uh, can you double click on the question? All right, it's not. Uh... <laughs> All right, sorry, can you show me the questions again? Then? That's okay, that's okay. Yeah, so uh, I'm assuming I understand the question correctly. No, I didn't. Uh, I did think about it, but um, it didn't. So uh, for, the, for the, oh, for the games. For the games, uh, no. For this game, yes, I did think about that. Um, 
No, it, it, uh, I did think about it, but I never really got to, to doing it. Every time I thought, no, it would be too much work, it would be too much work. But in retrospect, you know, after four years, maybe it was a good idea. So, uh, so yeah. So why Doom 3? Uh, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure actually why I started the project. I don't remember. But I do think Doom 3, because back, back then Doom 3 was uh, four years ago, it was open source like a year earlier or something. And I had downloaded the source code to read it, you know. But and like everybody here, you know, you, you store a lot of things on GitHub and, and you download code and you never read it. And that's, that's basically it. I can show you a demo, but uh, yeah, they have to switch screens here. So let's, let's read the last question and then I'll switch. Uh, what's the last question? Have you heard of? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have heard of it. Um, it does, yeah, uh, do that, but uh, it doesn't really help me much. Because this uh, string, um, I, I don't remember actually what, what the keyword is. It's not that, at least, but uh, sorry? Yes, thank you. Uh, what it does, and you will correct me if I'm wrong. So what it does, it, uh, it uses specific float import, uh, implementation to, be, uh, to allow it to be the same across all JVMs, across different uh, platforms. Am I saying this correctly? No? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, and it disables because sometimes uh, floating points will be widened to do some calculations, and then you know, uh, sh shortened or whatever you know again. And uh, as far as I know, it, it disables that. Yeah, yeah, he's the expert. You should ask him. So that's that's really. A <laughs> so yeah, sorry. Can you switch the screen again? Uh, yeah. Oh. So yeah, like I said, I'm showing everything in wireframe. It's it's looking uh, very bad. Yeah. The and it's, you know it's pretty cool. You know everything. I fix something. I break something else. So here, for example, I fix. I don't remember what I fixed, but then I broke the heads, so they're floating away. But that was working at first. Believe me, trust me. I have videos on YouTube that prove that. Um, but you know, as you can see, I'm not sure if you can. Yeah, you can't really see it. But a lot of textures are missing. For example, uh, the lights aren't working very well. Uh, they are working, but very limited. Uh, so if I can look up. Yeah, so here you can see lights in the spaceship, you know. But uh, the game doesn't have any ambient light at all, so if I disable the wireframes, it will be very, very dark. Um, sorry? I can, but I have to restart the game, and uh, the thing is already saying I'm out of time, so sorry. <laughs> oh, I hope I don't die. It's scarier this way, yeah? Yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> So this is also something I really like about the game. Hey, open, open, yeah. So because we have the wireframes, and this you normally don't see this, you know, but the way, if, if anybody knows anything about BSPs, BSP trees in games and such, you know, so the, 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 everything behind the door isn't rendered until the door is opened, you know, and you can see that because of the wireframes. Well, that's awesome, you know, and uh, yeah, I know. So I can move forward in the game, I can go pretty far, but you know, because of a lot of the stuff that isn't working, it won't really look that awesome. Uh. I also had uh, working sound, but then I broke the sound and I don't care. But that's not the reason that there's no sound, it's because they don't have any uh, sound uh, input output uh, thing. Oh, yeah, so that's. Uh, oh. Oh. Oh, I can look here. Come on. Yeah. So yeah, I'm gonna just uh, kill myself. It's easier that way. Okay. Any questions? Oh, any more questions? Actually, I don't have any time. We're out of time? Yeah. So I'm just gonna do this, actually. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>